afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. After the lecture, there'll be some questions, and then there'll be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall. Today, our speaker is Nathan Seiberg. Natty has been a professor in the School of Natural Sciences here at the Institute since 1997. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Tel Aviv University in 1977, and after a period of military service, his PhD from the Weizmann Institute in 1982. Then he came here as a member at the Institute from 1982 to 84, and returned as senior scientist and then associate professor at the Weizmann Institute uh, from 1985 to 89. At that point, he became a professor at Rutgers University, uh, and he stayed there until joining the faculty of the Institute in 1997. Natty is a theoretical physicist who's pioneered some of the most important and profound advances in our understanding of quantum field theory and of string theory in the last 25 years, particularly in relation to supersymmetry. And if you don't know what quantum field theory, string theory, and supersymmetry are, don't worry, Natty is about to explain all of this to you. And Natty has always been interested and involved in the essential task of relating theory to experiment. So it's my pleasure to invite him to talk to you about the world's largest experiment. Natty. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me at the back? That means no. So thank you for coming and that's such a lovely day with wonderful weather coming sitting here at the boring lecture hall. I appreciate it. The purpose of this talk is to share with you some of the excitement in the particle physics community. Excitement associated with the new experiment which will come online in about a year from today. But before I describe the experiment and what it might or might not tell us, we should put things in perspective and put the context so the first part of the talk, I'll talk about what we do understand, what the questions are, and what the challenges are. That will lead us to the second part of the talk, which will be about the description of the experiment. And the third part of the talk will be a little bit more speculative. I'll try to ask, what can the experiment tell us? Now, when we talk about science in general, and physics in particular, people find it usually very confusing and very counterintuitive especially because of the very large numbers which are involved. We have, we'll talk about very large distances and very short distances, and we'd like to get some intuitive feel for what the distances are. So to start, let me give you some feel of what the numbers are. We'll see large numbers like 10 to the fifth or 100,000. This is the ratio, this is a good analogy to keep in mind. 100,000 is the ratio between the size of a football field and a pinhole at the center. Equivalently, we can think of 100,000 as being the ratio between the size of the Earth and the length of a football field. How many football fields we can fit around the Earth. And if we multiply these two ratios, we get 10 to the 10th, this is a much bigger number, 10 billion, which tells us about the ratio between the size of the Earth and the size of a pinhole. So now that we know what big numbers are, we can talk about science. This is a ruler of the different scales that we see in science. In the range from the smallest scale, 10 to the minus 35, this is one over one with 35 zeros. This is a tiny distance, this is where quantum gravity is important. At the other end, 10 to the 26 meter, we see the largest distance we talk about. This is the size of the visible universe. We humans are somewhere here in the middle, one to two meters. And from here we can go to say the solar system. We have 10 to the 13th between these two numbers. So recall 10 to the 10th is how many pinholes we can fit around the Earth. So the ratio between our size of how many times we fit in the solar system is how many pinholes we can fit a thousand times around the Earth. This is really a big number. We can go 13 orders of magnitude further to the visible universe, telling how, how small we are compared to the universe how, and how insignificant we are, and that should give us some humility. We can also proceed in the opposite direction to shorter distances. We'll talk about atoms, which are at 10 to the minus 10 meters. And again, this ratio between us and the atom is the ratio between the size of the Earth and the pinhole. 
And we can go to even shorter distances, another eight orders of magnitude. This is where particle physics is. And finally, very, very short distances, we have quantum gravity. Now, over the last several centuries, there has been enormous effort, and we basically understand the basic laws, the fundamental rules that control all phenomena in most of this range. Throughout most of this range, we understand the basic equations. This is not to say that we understand all phenomena. They are very rich and complicated phenomena which follow from equations we understand. We feel that we understand the equations. We might not know how to solve the equations, but at least we know what the concepts are and what the equations are. Now, in this, what we, some of us do in science is trying to push the envelope and extend this range, either understanding phenomena at shorter distances or, at the other end, phenomena at larger distances. Now, throughout most of this talk, I'll focus on this range of distances, ranging from the size of atoms, going down to shorter distances. Notice that the green region, which this corresponds to this talk, extends beyond the red region, which describes the region we really understand. So, at the beginning of the talk, I'll talk about this range, where we really know what's going on, we know what the basic rules are, and then I'll add the new frontier, pushing the envelope, trying to see what we can learn at shorter distances. Over the last century, physicists constructed a model of particle physics, and it's known as the standard model. So in the coming slides, I'll describe the standard model and go through its three ingredients. So I'll first enumerate the three ingredients, and then in the coming slides, I'll elaborate on that. The first ingredient is the principle the standard model of particle physics is based on quantum mechanics and special relativity, two of the conceptual revolutions of 20th century physics. The second ingredient is various matter particles. There are electrons, there are other particles called quarks, and there may are many others. The third ingredient is the forces of the standard model. The standard model describes the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the nuclear force. So let me go through this list and say a few words about every one of these elements. First, the principles. During the 20th century, science has seen three major conceptual revolutions, revolutions which are very counterintuitive, and they apply in extreme situations, situations which are very far from everyday, world, from everyday experience, from everyday life. The first revolution is that of quantum mechanics. It applies to small objects of the size of an atom or even smaller than an atom. And the world at these short distances is very different from the world we are familiar with. The world at very short distances is fuzzy. We have uncertainty. We cannot measure at the same time the position of a particle and its velocity. Objects fluctuate and so forth. So this is extremely counterintuitive. The second revolution of the 20th century is special relativity. It applies to objects moving at very high velocities, much higher than everyday life, velocities close to the speed of light. Here we also see some bizarre phenomena that we are not familiar with. We see mixing between space and time. We see that there is a maximal velocity. We cannot travel faster than the speed of light. We can convert mass into energy and energy into mass and so forth. The third revolution of the 20th century is general relativity. It applies to situations with strong gravitational force. Here we see that space and time can be curved. There are black holes and all sorts of other marvelous phenomena. The standard model of particle physics uses these two conceptual revolutions, quantum mechanics and special relativity, and leaves out general relativity. And I'll say more about that later. So we talked about the principles. The second ingredient of the standard model is the matter particle. Before the 20th century, physicists knew, and chemists knew, that there are atoms. Later, it was understood that the atoms themselves are composite. They have electrons. These are negatively charged particles, which move around like that. And at the center of the atom, we have a nucleus. A nucleus, which is made out of protons, depicted here in red, and neutrons, which are in blue. The protons are positive electric charge, and the neutrons are neutral. Now, this picture is actually a bit misleading. The nucleus is very small compared to the atom. The size of the atom compared to the size of the Nucleus is our friend 10 to the fifth, or 100,000. So the actual size of the nucleus here, if we think of it as being our pinhole, then the, atom, the whole atom is like a football field. 
So the nucleus is really tiny at the center of the atom, and it was enlarged in this picture so that we can see it. it during the second half of the 20th century, the problem of this story became a lot more interesting and a lot richer. Physicists realized that the protons and the neutrons, which appear in the, as objects inside the nucleus, inside the atom, are actually composite, and they are made out of particles known as quarks. Later on, people learned that there are many species of quarks, giving various bizarre names like up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. We talked about the electron, this negatively charged particle, but it turns out that it's also not unique. It's part of a larger family, electron, muon, tau, and there are also other particles called neutrinos. So we have a whole alphabet soup of particles here, lots of particles with bizarre names and special properties, but they can be arranged in some kind of a periodic table. We call the periodic table in chemistry, where we arrange the various elements in various rows and columns according to their properties. First, chemists organized the atoms in this periodic table, and later they understand the conceptual underlying structure which explains the periodic table. So again, first there was kind of a de phenomenological description where we took the elements and put them in the table, and then we understood why this table is there. An analogous situation here is that we have this periodic table of matter particles, but we don't understand the fundamental structure underlying it, which explains why we have this periodic table. In the case of chemistry, the periodic table was eventually understood as a consequence of the structure of atoms. We don't have the analogous story here, and I'll say more about that later. So this is what I wanted to say about the second ingredient. The first was the principles, the second is the matter particles, and now we're going to add the third ingredient, which is the forces. Before the 20th century, physicists knew of two kinds of forces. The electromagnetic force, which combines electricity and magnetism, and we are familiar with it in, in everyday life. And the second force is the gravitational force. This is the force which attracts us to the Earth. This is the force which attracts, which affects the motions of stars, and so forth. During the 20th century, Two other forces were discovered. First, the strong nuclear force. This is the force which holds the protons and the neutrons together inside the nucleus. Recall the protons are, have, electric, have positive electric charge, and as such, they repel each other. Equal charges repel each other. So what is it that holds the protons inside the nucleus, preventing them from just flying apart? There must be a very strong force which pulls them back in. This force is the strong nuclear force. It's also associated with nuclear energy. It gives the energy of the sun and other phenomena. The other force is the weak nuclear force. It is associated with radioactive decays and again, many other phenomena. Now we see four forces here. The standard model of particle physics describes three of them. The electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. And it leaves out the gravitational force. This is in accord with my statement earlier that one of the three revolutions of the 20th century, that of general relativity, is left out. General relativity, it describes gravity, so whatever is associated with gravity, we postpone it for part of this talk, it will come back later. So again, these are the three forces which we discuss, the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. Now forces in the standard model have a very peculiar property, they are mediated by the exchange of force particle. Here is a picture of an electron coming from the left and another electron coming from the right. The two electrons have negative charges. Both of them have has negative, every one of them has negative charge, and as such, they repel each other. So the electron that comes from the left is reflected to the, that comes from the left is reflected back to the left. And the electron which comes from the right is again repelled to the right. How does this happen? The electron that comes from the left emits a particle known as a photon. And by doing that, it is deflected here. The other electron comes from here, it absorbs the photon, and by doing that, it is deflected here. By analogy, think of two basketball players. One of them jumps up in the air with a, with a ball, throws the ball. As he throws the ball, he is pushed back. The other player jumps up and catches the ball. As he catches the ball, he is again deflected back. So overall, we can think of the two basketball players going up and deflected a little bit, as if there is repulsion between them. But the repulsion between the two basketball player, between the two basketball players, is nothing but the exchange of the ball between them. Similarly, here, the electromagnetic force between the two electrons 
come from the ex through the exchange of a particle called the photon. Now for every one of the forces we talked about, there is a corresponding force particle, the particle which mediates that force. Finally, there is another ingredient in the standard model, another kind of a force particle, known as the Higgs particle, men, men, named after the Scottish physicist Peter Higgs. This particle is extremely interesting and it's characterized by two properties. Number one, this particle is responsible for all masses of particles. The mass of the electrons, the masses of the quarks, and even some of the, mass, the masses of some of the force particles, like the force particles of the weak force. The second interesting characteristic of the Higgs particle is that we haven't discovered it yet. All the other particles in the standard model, this long list of particles, all these particles have already been discovered. The Higgs particle has not yet been discovered, and it's not that people didn't look. They looked extremely hard and didn't find it. Many of us believe that the particle exists and it hasn't been discovered yet simply because it's too heavy. Remember, mass is the same as energy. In order to produce a very heavy particle, we need a lot of energy, and our machines have not yet have enough energy to create this particle. Hopefully, future experiments, which will have more energy, will lead to the discovery of the Higgs particle. Now, this standard model might sound to you like a very complicated story. It relies on two revolutions, both of them are counterintuitive, quantum mechanics and special relativity, very obscure, very bizarre phenomena. There is a very long list of elementary matter particles with bizarre names and bizarre properties. There are three forces, and the whole story sounds, and there is a particle, the Higgs particle, which has not yet been discovered. So you might doubt that this thing is actually true. But in fact, I think it's fair to say that this is the best theory, the best model, that any science ever had. This is the most spectacular theory, the most successful theory that mankind ever came up with. First of all, with a small number of parameters, a handful of parameters, we can explain and predict literally billions and billions of experimental results, all of them without a single mistake. There isn't a single experiment which contradicts the standard model. And people have been doing it for a long time, and there isn't a single result which is in contradiction with the standard model. So this is an unprecedented success. And let me give you an example of this success. Recall the electron. We talked about the electron as being a, mass, as being a particle with negative electric charge. But in addition to that, every electron is like a little magnet, a magnet which has a north pole and a south pole, very much like the magnet in your compass. The fact that the electron is a magnet just the fact that it's a magnet is already a consequence of quantum mechanics. Without quantum mechanics, the electron cannot be a magnet. But we can also ask more precisely, how strong is the magnet? And there are several, there are natural units in the problem to measure how strong the magnet is. And in the natural unit, naively, the strength of the magnet is one. But we see that we have many more digits. So theorists have been working extremely hard to calculate all these digits, and I'll say something about that. These are 10 significant digits. It's very rare that anywhere in science we do calculations with two or three significant digits. Here we have 10. This is incredibly accurate. But just as theorists work very hard to compute this number, experimentalists also work very hard to measure this number. And this is the state of the art. The experimentalists are better than the theorists. They have 12 significant digits. They are better than the theorists. But notice the spectacular agreement between the two. Just to put things in perspective, the one is already a consequence of quantum mechanics. When this correction, the 001, it's a one per mil correction to the strength of the magnet, when this was discovered, this was a major breakthrough in physics. The physics that goes into this one, this correction here, is the electromagnetic force and the details of its action, quantum mechanics, and special relativity. You mess with one of these three, you don't get this one right. The other digits here are even more impressive. And as we progress to add more and more digits, we have to do more precise calculations. Calculations which are sensitive to more and more subtle properties of the standard model. These remaining digits are sensitive to details of the weak force, details of the strong force, the masses of the quarks, and the whole structure of the standard model. The first that we have such agreement tells us that we really know what we are doing. This is unprecedented, spectacular success of the theory. To be honest, I have to admit that this example is not typical. 
There are very few quantities which can be calculated to such high accuracy, very few quantities that can be measured, that can be measured to such high accuracy. But whenever we can calculate something and it, the same quantity can be measured, we have perfect agreement between theory and experiment. So we really know that the standard model is right. So given that the standard model is right, we can ask ourselves, what's next? What are the open questions? So we'll, have, we'll discuss now problems now, problems of different nature. The first problem is that we still have a loose end. One aspect of the standard model, this particle, the Higgs particle, has not yet been experimentally discovered, and we would like to find it. The second problem is not a loose end in the model. The model is right. Let's assume that the Higgs particle is found. We would like a deeper theory which explains why the standard model is right. We would like to explain the standard model. I've already mentioned one such question. This is this periodic table of matter particles. We have all these matter particles. They are, are arranged in some kind of a periodic table, very much like in chemistry. In chemistry, the periodic table was eventually understood as a consequence of the structure of atoms. We are looking for a similar explanation here, something that will tell us why we have this periodic table of matter particles. The forces pose their own questions. There are three forces, the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic force. Why do we have these three forces? What determines their strength, etc.? The next question is another detail of the standard model. The various particles have masses and their various parameters. We would like some deeper theory which explains all these parameters. So notice the difference in flavor between the first question, between the first question, which is a loose end in the standard model. And these, these are questions we try to probe beyond the standard model, finding a more complete theory which is valid, which has a larger range of validity, a theory that will explain the standard model. The third problem is yet of a totally different nature. Our friends, the astronomers, tell us that most of the energy in the universe is dark. And not only that, there is some matter in the universe, and most of the matter is also dark. I'll say more about that later. All this is not included in the standard model. So the standard model has to be modified to explain all these experimental results which come from the universe as a whole. And the fourth question is yet of a totally different flavor. I've stressed before that we did not include the gravitational force. Correspondingly, we did not include the third revolution of the 20th century, that of general relativity. We would like to in enlarge the standard model so that it will incorporate the gravitational force. And the first attempt to do that that we know about is string theory. Hopefully, string theory will explain everything, but this is still an ongoing pro this is still a problem. We'd like to pursue it further. So to recapitulate, this is where we are. This is the bottom part of this ruler that I talked about. We talked about humans, molecules, atoms. Go further down, we talked about the nuclei of the atom, and we went to particle physics. The red range was where we understand the basic rules, and the talk is the green region, and now we are around here. We know what we know, we know what the problems are, and now we're trying to push the envelope to go to the new frontier and ask what happens at shorter distances. In order to explore short distances, we need a microscope, but we need a very powerful microscope, a microscope whose, res whose resolution is not one micron, but a microscope whose resolution is 10 to the minus 19 meters. We understand the physics at 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now we would like to push it further and understand the physics and under explore the physics at distances of 10 to the minus 19 meters. This is currently being done by an accelerator at Fermi Lab near Chicago, Illinois. And it will be done better in a new accelerator, which is built at a laboratory called CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. And the results are expected in a few years, and this is the cause of the excitement. So in the coming slides, I'll describe the experiment. The accelerator is called LHC. This is an acronym for Large Hadron Collider. Hadron is a particle made out of quarks. In this case, it refers to protons. And it's located in a laboratory called European Center for Nuclear Research, and the acronym in French is CERN. This is an expensive machine. It costs about two and a half billion dollars, pays mostly by contributions in Europe, with a relatively small contribution of the US. A better and bigger accelerator was supposed to be built in this country, but unfortunately, 
it was canceled. Had it not been canceled, by now we would have had the results, and I would not have to give this talk about what the future would be. It would be much more complete in telling you what's actually true. So how does the accelerator work? We said it's an accelerator of protons. So that's basically what it does. It takes a proton that comes from the left and another proton which comes from the right, and the two protons collide. As the two protons collide, they create a lot of debris, particles which shoot out in various directions. The second part of the experiment is one part is the accelerator. The second part is the detector, the detector that measures these particles which come out, which particles come out, at what energy they come out, in which direction they come out, and so forth. So let us first discuss the accelerator. In order, the accelerator should have two important properties. First, it should have very high energy. It should accelerate the projectiles, these protons, to increase very, very high energy. The reason for that is we would like to acquire sensitivity or resolution to extremely short distances. So in order to be able to resolve distances, which are about one thousandth the size of a proton, we need to accelerate the protons to incredibly high energy. Also, most collisions, as we will see, are somewhat uninteresting. What we are really interested in are very rare phenomena that do not happen very often. In order to have these phenomena happen at all, we should have many collisions. How can we have many collisions? We should have many protons and let them collide with each other and do it again and again and again with many collisions such that we can fish out the few collisions that we are really interested in. Let us first discuss the high energy. We collide two protons, each with an energy of 7 TeV. TeV is the unit of energy we use here. And to get a feel of what one TeV is, we can think of it as being the energy of a flying mosquito. Now that might not look a lot to you, because the mosquito does not have a lot of energy, but you should remember that we put this energy in a single proton. And the mosquito has many protons in it. So one TeV is the energy of a single, uh, of a single proton, it, which is squeezed into a region which is only 10 to the minus 12 the size of the mosquito. This is a lot of energy. Another way of seeing how high the energy is, is to remember that we have many protons. We really have two beams of protons which collide. And we can ask what's the total energy in the beam, not in a single electron, but in the whole beam. The total energy in the beam is comparable to the energy of an aircraft carrier moving at 10 knots. This is incredible energy. And this incredible energy of this aircraft carrier is squeezed into a beam whose profile, whose size, is about one millimeter. So think of this fantastic energy, the aircraft carrier that moves, and then we squeeze all this energy to a tiny region. This is a picture of the accelerator. The accelerator is here. It is deep underground, 100 meters below ground. It's a big circle. 27 kilometers or 17 miles around. And to get a feel for the size, this is the international, this is the Geneva International Airport. You can see the runways. And you can see how bigger, how much bigger the accelerator is. This is an older accelerator, which is being used as an injector where protons are accelerated first in the smaller accelerator and then into the bigger accelerator. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. We have this tunnel underground, 100 meters underground, and in the tunnel there are two tubes, two circular tubes, which are depicted here in blue and in red. In the blue tube, protons circle counterclockwise. In the red tube, protons circle clockwise. And these two tubes cross each other at four crossing points, one, two, three, four, where the two tubes cross each other and the protons which move in one direction can collide with the protons which move in the, in the opposite direction. Once they collide, there is debris coming out, and there are four detectors, one at each crossing point, which examine the debris. So as I said, they collide at these four points. The protons will be in 3,000 bunches of 10 to the 11th protons in each. So it's not just one proton coming from the right and one proton coming from the left, but in fact, instead, it's, these are two bunches of 10 to the 11th protons in each passing through each other. As they pass through each other, there will be about 20 to 25 collisions, but most of the protons will continue to fly and will continue to circle around the tube. 25 nanoseconds later, nanoseconds is one billionth of a second, 
two new bunches come in, cross each other, there will be a few collisions, the debris will shoot out, the bunches will leave, and 25 nanoseconds later, there will be again two new bunches crossing. So this will happen again and again, and very often, and extremely fast. Overall, there will be about one billion collisions per second in the detector. Lots of collisions. Most of them are totally uninteresting. Only about 10 to 100 of the collisions will be of some interest to us and will be recorded. The very interesting collisions, those collisions which will teach us about new physics, are even more rare. They will happen every once, every few hours or every few days. So this is really getting a needle, in, finding a needle in a haystack. We have a billion collisions a second, and we have to wait a whole day to find one interesting event that we are really interested in. This will happen with the detectors. This is a picture of the Atlas detector. This is one of the four detectors, the biggest of them. It's very big, it's about a five-story five building, and recall the whole thing is 100 meters underground. The beam of uh, protons come from the left here, comes from the right here, and the protons collide here inside the detector. So here we have the collision, the debris shoots out various directions, and there's a lot of hardware here which will explore what kind of particles come out, at what energy, in which direction, and so forth. To get a feel for how large this piece of equipment is, this is a man, this is a woman, here is another man, and here is another woman. So this is really a very big and very complicated piece of equipment. The detectors will store only about 100 collisions per second. Recall, we start from about a billion collisions a second, but it will store and write down only about 100 of them. There is no way it can really store all the information. This is just too much information. There will be an online computer which is going to decide whether the, the information is interesting and is worth writing or not. So again, we have this story of two bunches crossing each other. There is a collision. The detector makes some rough measurement. The computer decides whether this is worth recording or not. If it's re worth recording, it writes it down. 25 nanoseconds later, a new bunch comes in. So the whole thing has to act extremely fast. Even though only about 100 collisions per second will be written down, this will be enormous amount of data. Altogether, in every year, there will be 15 petabytes of data. We are more familiar with gigabytes, which we use in our home PC. A petabyte is a million gigabytes. So the total amount of data that will be collected, if we write it on CDs that we are familiar with, we'll need a stack of CDs 20 kilometer long, and that will be every year. That poses a huge challenge in computer science. How do we deal with such huge amount of data? How do we store it? How do we ship it from one computer to the other? How do we sort it out? How do we analyze it? And so forth, and there are so interesting solutions to some of these problems, hopefully all. So this is what I wanted to do about, to say about the experiment. This is the second part of the talk. The first was the standard model, what we know. The second part was what the experiment is. And now we can go to the, what is perhaps more interesting, the question, what will the LHC find? So before we get into the detailed discussion of about what the LHC will find, let me say out front, we don't know. We don't know what we will find, and that's why we do the experiment. But we have a shopping list. We have a wish list. First on the list is finding the Higgs particle. This was this loose end in the standard model, this particle that we have not yet discovered experimentally. We would like to find it and explore its properties. This is interesting for two reasons. First, it completes the story of the standard model. We have this marvelous model that works extremely well, except that we haven't yet found the Higgs particle, so we would like to find the Higgs particle. Second, we said that the Higgs particle is very important because it is responsible for masses of particles. Understanding better the Higgs particle will shed more light and will clarify the origin of mass. So this is a worthwhile thing to do. Next on our agenda is to find more particles. I said before that perhaps the standard model is incomplete. Perhaps we need to extend the standard model, adding new physics. This would be much more exciting if this is true. So we would like the LHC to find new particles, particles which reflect new physics at shorter distances. The leading candidate for such new physics is a theory called supersymmetry. 
So the coming slides, I'll tell you what supersymmetry is and why we think that supersymmetry might be discovered there. We talked about matter particles and force particles. The matter particles, for example, the electron or the quarks, and the force particles like the photon, particle associated with every force. Supersymmetry unifies the matter particles and the force particles. So rather than discussing two separate entities, matter particles and force particles, particles which mediate forces, instead we have a single entity because supersymmetry unifies them. According to supersymmetry, every force particle has kind of a sister matter particle. For example, the electron sister is called a selectron. So we have a long list of matter particles in the standard model. The idea of supersymmetry is that every one of them is related to a heavier force particle. And the known force particles, like the photons, are related to heavier matter particles. So what we would like to know is whether these heavy particles really exist. If they exist, this tells us that supersymmetry, the idea of supersymmetry is right. If they don't exist, too bad. This idea is not right. Why do we like supersymmetry? There are several different motivations. Some of them are more technical than others. The first is the idea of unification of forces. We talked about three forces in the standard model, the strong force, the weak force, and the electromagnetic force. Every force has its own strength. So at some distances, around 10 to the minus 18 meters, we can measure the strength of the three forces. And you see that the strong force is stronger than the weak force, and the electromagnetic force is even weaker than that. Now in the standard model, the strength of forces varies with distance. So we can extrapolate to longer distances here and see that we really know what we are doing by seeing how these forces, how the strength of these forces varies with distance. But we can also theoretically extrapolate to shorter distances. This is a theoretical calculation. We haven't measured anything at shorter distances. But let's pretend we know what we are doing, assume there is supersymmetry, and extrapolate the strength of these forces to shorter distances. And that's what we find. With just throwing in supersymmetry, the strength of the three forces vary with distance. The strong force becomes weaker as we go to shorter distances. The weak and the electromagnetic force become stronger as we go to shorter distances. And these three lines meet at a point. And this is quite accurate. This is accurate to about 1%. What does it mean? We have three distinct forces at these distances. All of them have the same strength at this distance. So the idea is that at very short distances, there's only one force in the universe, which, has, which manifests itself as three distinct forces at distances of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So fundamentally, there's only one force. We unify the one, two, three, these three distinct forces into a single force. That's extremely appealing. It ans if this is true, it answers some of the questions I asked earlier. Why do we have three forces? Why are their strengths what they are? They are all determined as different manifestations of a single force. So as I said, the distinct forces become of the same strength at short distance, and that unifies them. I mentioned this periodic table of matter particles, which we can arrange in a table very much like the periodic table in chemistry, but we do not understand the underlying structure which explains why we have this periodic table. Unification of forces explains some of the aspects of this periodic table, and this is another reason why we like it. So this whole is very nice, this whole thing is very nice, except that it assumes supersymmetry. So that's motivation, another motivation for supersymmetry. The next motivation for supersymmetry is dark matter. Recent astronomical results tell us that only about one-sixth of the matter in the universe is in the form of particles we know of. The universe has kind of matter there. We know it's there because we see the motion of stars, which are afflicted by that. We can also measure the dynamics of the whole universe as a whole. So we know that this number one sixth, rather precisely, most of the matter in the universe is not the kind of matter that we know of in the standard model. In the context of supersymmetry, we can offer an explanation to that. Supersymmetry naturally leads to a new stable particle which can be identified as the dark matter. So the universe is full of clouds of this new supersymmetric particle. This particle does not interact very strongly with electromagnetism. So as we look at it in the sky, we don't see it. It does not interact with light. However, it has mass, it has energy, it interacts with gravity. So as stars move around, the motion of stars is sensitive to the existence of these clouds of particles. So if this is true, we have these particles, 
then they can explain why we have dark matter, why our friends, the astronomers, tell us that there are dark matters. What they see is the consequence of these new stable particles which exist in supersymmetry. There are also other motivations for supersymmetry. A little bit more technical, it can explain why the scale of quantum gravity, this 10 to the minus 35 meters that I talked about earlier, is so much shorter than the scale of particle physics. Second, supersymmetry is very natural in the context of string theory. In fact, historically, the idea of supersymmetry originated from string theory and was first suggested by string theory. It's also a beautiful theoretical idea. I said it, it unifies the matter particles with coarse particles. We have these two kinds of particles. It unifies them together. It also has many applications to other branches of physics and to mathematics. It will really be a shame if we have such a beautiful theoretical idea and it's not realized in nature. So it should be completely clear that convincing as these arguments are, they certainly do not prove that supersymmetry should be there. We might turn on the LHC and look for it and we either find supersymmetry or we don't. So they do suggest that supersymmetry is there, but it might also be that super, the idea of supersymmetry is wrong. But supersymmetry addresses many interesting questions that I had mentioned earlier. Questions like unification of forces, this dark matter, and others. So if not for supersymmetry, there might be something else that the LHC will find that will address another theory that will address the same issues. We still have to address these issues. One possibility is that there are new forces, new strong forces whose range is extremely short, around 10 to the minus 19 meters. Maybe the LHC will find these. Another possibility is that in addition to the three space dimensions we know about, there are other space dimensions whose dimensions are whose size is small, and maybe the LHC will discover these dimensions. My favorite on this list is none of the above, namely something that we poor theorists were not smart enough to think about. But hopefully the LHC will be there, and they will find the experimental signatures of something else, and that will stimulate our ideas. One can ask, what's after the LHC? There are several possibilities, first on the experimental side, People discussed an upgrade of the LHC, upgrading, increasing the energy and increasing and or increasing the luminosity, such that we'll get better sensitivity at shorter distances. A more ambitious project is the International Linear Collider, or acronym ILC. It will give us more details about what the LHC can find, either supersymmetry or something else. It will allow a more detailed analysis of, this, of these theories. And this year, a committee of the National Academies of strongly rec endorsed the ILC, so hopefully it will happen. On the more theoretical side, the ultimate goal is to include gravity. I've already mentioned that. And the leading known theory to include gravity is string theory, so there will be continuing theoretical effort to study string theory. So these are the conclusions, the take-home lesson from this talk. And that's something I think everybody can memorize. It's not that hard. We have this marvelous theory of particle physics known as the standard model. It is extremely successful. I said it's the best theory that mankind ever came up with. And it explains all phenomena at distances larger than 10 to the minus 18 meters. The LHC will push the envelope and will explore physics at shorter distances. It's very important to stress that we don't know what the LHC will find. Whatever it will find, it will address very interesting questions. And here is a list of them. It can shed light on the structure of matter, forces, origin of mass, origin of the universe, dark matter, the nature of space and time, and so forth. Every one of these questions is extremely interesting and extremely profound. And hopefully, we'll learn something at least about one of them. Finally, supersymmetry is the most likely candidate to be experimentally discovered there, but there could be other possibilities which are more interesting, perhaps. So many physicists are eagerly waiting for the LHC. We would like the machine to work, we'd like it to work well. We anticipate that the discoveries will be very exciting. They will set the agenda and stimulate scientific research for decades to come. So this brings me to the end of the talk, but this is clearly not the end of the story. I'm sure that many of you will come back in a few years to hear another talk 
about what the LHC will have found. Thank you. So we have, the director informed me that you should ask questions. Yes. I don't remember the precise numbers. Uh, the energy was supposed to be bigger. The energy was supposed to be bigger and it was supposed to have various capabilities that the LHC does not have. That was one, these were some of the reasons it was more expensive and perhaps it was a political mistake to push for a more expensive machine. It's really a shame that it was canceled because otherwise today in 2006 I could have given a talk about what actually happens at 10 to the minus 19 meters rather than speculate. I'm not an expert about that, so I should defer to people who know more. Avi. The reason why <coughs> you expect the customer to deliver it first by request to improvement is one of the timing issues? Why? Yeah, th this is a very good question. There are go good reasons to believe why the right energy is where it is. In fact, we should have already discovered supersymmetry. In the simplest version of supersymmetry, we should have already discovered it in earlier experiments. The fact that we have not yet discovered supersymmetry shows that we are in kind of a corner of parameter space of possibilities. We have to push it to this 10 to the minus 19 meters rather than 10 to the minus 18 meters, but hopefully it's there. If it's not there within another order of magnitude, then it's probably, there's no reason to believe it's, it's around the corner. So it's either around the corner or, or not there at all, or, or very, very far. Yes. Where exactly is? So it's not a question of strong, it's a question of the mass of the particle. The idea is that for every matter particle that we know about, there is a heavier a force particle, and for every force particle that we know about, there is a heavier matter particle. What exactly determines which particle is heavier is a very interesting question. Some of that we, c we know about and most of it we don't have a cl clear understanding of. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, that's the picture. No, no, it's not a change, they are just pairs. Yeah, and the pairs can be oriented this way or arranged this way or that way. I hope this answers your question. Particles come in pairs. Yes. No, there are experimental groups which are already assigned and they will do the experiments. I'm not part of them, I'm not an experimentalist. Even if I'm given access, I don't know what to do with it. I hope that they know what they're doing. <laughs> I'm sure they know what they're doing. And they will tell us what the results are. When we look at the debris from these collisions, we'll see there are various signatures that will tell us what the, that the Higgs particle was created and decayed. So what we do, we send these two protons at each other, and we see all sorts of particles coming out. Depending on the details of the particles, at what energy they come and in which direction, we can tell that the Higgs particle was created, and we can even go back and reconstruct its mass and its, all its properties, how strongly it interacts with other particles and so forth. So we can get a very detailed picture of the Higgs particle just by looking at the debris of these collisions. This might look a little bit far-fetched, but in fact, this is what particle physicists have been doing for a very long time, bombarding particles on each other, looking at the debris, and by doing that, reconstructing what actually happened. So the experimentalists really know how to do that. Yeah. 
there are different kinds of the, the, there are different kinds of layers of detectors which are sensitive to different properties. And the reason the detectors are so complicated and big is that there are different layers which measure the one component measures the energy, the other one tracks where the particles go, and there's a lot of electronics there which try to put all these numbers together. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If supersymmetry is discovered, it's not a proof that, that string theory is right. It's a, it's a boost to the idea of, super, of string theory, but it's not a proof that string theory is right. Conversely, if supersymmetry is not discovered at the LHC, it doesn't mean anything for, the, for string theory. We just lost the boost, but it doesn't say that string theory is wrong. In fact, some people who support string theory make very strong argument that supersymmetry shouldn't be there at the LHC. It should be there at much higher energies, but not at the energies of LHC. But when I say much higher, I don't mean another order of magnitude, not another factor of 10. I mean far, far higher energies. That's an excellent question. We don't. And there's just a technical problem. We, they cannot write down all the information. There's just too much information. So they have to decide in advance how they make cuts and how this computer will decide online what to write down and what to throw away. Most of the data will be thrown away. Hopefully, this is the uninteresting data. The cuts are made in a very clever way, but there could be a mistake there. That would be unfortunate. Or, or the, yes? Yeah, but it could still be, it, it would help. Having a lot of data will help. But remember, we write down, not we, the experimentalists write down about 100 events out of a billion. So when you say that most of it is thrown away, it's really most of it. Very little is kept. Pierre? This is an interest, this is a big challenge. And there are various tricks to do that. There are, some of them are slightly di displaced. Even though the, ex the detector is so big, they have incredible accuracy to where actually the collision happens to the size of microns, where the collision actually happens, and which is quite amazing. You have this five-story building, and they know where particles collide at, at, with accuracy of microns. They can also look at the particles which come out, and they can try and reconstruct what actually happened. Hopefully very short. <laughs> so what the experimentalists tell us is that some things they will detect very easily. In particular, some of the signatures of supersymmetry, depending on where particles exactly are, what the masses are, in some of the range, they will be able to tell us that the superpartners of the quarks, they, they could discover that within months. So that's extreme. We're talking about the machine turning on in about a year. It will take them several months to calibrate and make sure it works right, and then few months of running, and they will know whether these particles are there or not. More subtle phenomena will take longer, and maybe they will miss them altogether. Let's hope this doesn't happen. There was a question at the end. Yeah. No, they, they're talking about running several years, and in addition to that, there are really four detectors which have different capabilities, and the four detectors are better or worse in different aspects, and they will explore different kind of physics. Will, will it help to unify the different string theories with the end theory? Or? There aren't different string theories. There's only one theory. <laughs> so it's, this has already been done. It has been unified by the person sitting next to you. <laughs> I think at the moment they will, 
analyze the data, and I think they really deserve it. They have been working on this machine for a very long time, waiting to get the data, and I think they deserve a first shot at the data. Oh, I didn't see you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. There is no competition between one kind of science and another. There is no reason not to do both. And the question of high TC superconductivity is a very, very interesting question which should be pursued and there should be funding for this, age, for this uh, research. The research money that goes into particle physics is not instead of going to condensed matter physics. The two live in harmony and the two fields led to ideas across fields from one to the other, and it's not to say that one field is more important than the other. Both of them should be funded. On the other hand, I would say that one should not use arguments like that to act against funding for particle physics. Well, first of all, it's not related to the LHC. That's easy. I'm not an expert, but my friends, the astronomers, still don't take it very seriously. This is not to say that he's wrong. Maybe he's right. There were some ideas that people would, which were not taken very seriously for many years and ended up being right. But at the moment, the consensus is that this is not right. And we are looking for more conventional explanations for dark matter. For example, another stable particle. Well, the LHC can find, can explode 10 to the minus 19 yeah, meters. Well, it will, things become incredibly com more complicated as we try to go to shorter distances. And maybe another order of magnitude can be achieved. I don't know how to do that. But it might also be that somebody would come up with a totally different technology. Instead of accelerating protons, this incredible energy with these huge accelerators, there will be some other idea that will allow us to explore shorter distances. I don't know if a theoretical bound. Your friend, your great friend is saying that we, we do not have enough energy to reach our LHC. And the part is, it just happened that there are no particles shot with, uh, with, uh, with the LHC. How do you convince the funding agency that this, this might not happen? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think if the, they turn on the LHC and for some reason it doesn't work at all, you know, the beam missed each other, or you know, the electronic burns down. I don't know. There's an earthquake and the whole thing would die. Could, more seriously, it could be that turn on the LHC and very little is discovered. Maybe all our concepts are wrong. So that would be interesting theoretically because we'll have to revise many of our prejudices, many of our concepts, and so forth. The other, the flip side. I'll be very interested in building the ILC. I don't know how difficult it will be to convince the funding agencies or the public in general to pay the bill for such a project. I don't know. I hope people will be convinced because the questions which are being addressed, and I made a list of them there, are really interesting fundamental questions. What's matter? What are forces? Why do we have masses? What's the origin of the universe? What's the nature of space and time? All of these are extremely interesting questions. And shedding light on even one of them, I think, would be a major success. So let's hope this doesn't happen. But we'll know very sure. It's not something that will happen in a century. We'll know within a few years.
And if not for the cancellation of the SSC, by now we would have known. I'm sorry? What? Oh, that's a simulation. That's not the real thing. This is a, mach this is a, mach a piece of software which acts as if there is an experiment. It is, well, it has some of the same parameters, but you will not be able to make new discoveries with this program because this program was written by people who said, you can change the parameters there and have new discoveries, but it's not for real. I guess there are no more questions. So I, we're all invited to a reception. <laughs> <laughs>